Hello again. Welcome to our Mr. Roberts history video. Today we are discussing the Peasants Revolt. Now much of the information for today's video was taken from this amazing book with a great title, The Summer of Blood, The Peasants Revolt of 1381 by Dan Jones. So if you want to dive deeper into the topic, I would recommend you pick up a copy of that book. So the Peasants' Revolt. We are, of course, in the year 1381, keeping in mind that the 1300s are known as the 14th century. It's always one more than you think. So at the moment, even though it's 2021, we are in the 21st century, the 1900s, 20th century. So we are talking about 14th century England here. In fact, the late 14th century England in 1381. Now, the Peasants' Revolt. This is an uprising by the peasants of that year against, well, not necessarily directly their king, but it ends up going all the way to the top and all the way to London. So let's get into it. You will find in Highbury at the manor, uh, there is an Islington People's Park dedicated to the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Now, the Peasants' Revolt did not take place in just one place in uh, all of England. Uh, it took place across much of the South East specifically, but also in places in the north of the nation. So what could have possibly happened in 1381 to get so many people upset? Well, hopefully by the end of this video, you'll know. Okay, so this takes place between the 30th of May and the 15th of June, 1381. Uh, now, I first learned about this, and this is true, um, from a birthday card, because my birthday just so happens to be the 30th of May. And uh, me being a, a fantastic little student as a child, I think it was my seventh or eighth birthday, I had a birthday card that had all the things that happened on the 30th of May, and the Peasants Revolt was on it. So that was how I first learned about this, almost by accident. Now, this uprising began in the counties of Kent and Essex and snowballed from there. So essentially, it escalated. It started as a relatively small thing, and it just kept getting further and further and further, making progress and progress. Rebel groups ended up marching on London and attacked towns and villages as they went. So why on earth is this such an important event, this vicious attack on all these towns and villages? Why would these people be remembered as heroes by some? Well, again, hopefully you know by the end of this video. Now, the riots begin in Kent and Essex. Now, I don't know how many times uh, this has come up throughout history uh, and how many of these videos you have watched, but you may have heard me say once or twice before that there's one thing that people hate doing and that's paying taxes. And that is what this is all about. So they start as these riots, these people hating these taxes, but they don't really have a central leader or commander and it's just this anger being vented by these people and having to pay more and more money. But eventually they start becoming organized and the leader uh, that is appointed is a man by the name of Watt Tyler. Now, Watt Tyler becomes quite an important figure. So make sure we remember that the, the leader of the Peasants' Revolt is a man by the name of Watt Tyler. Now, you can see this has been going on for about a week, leaderless, before eventually they start to come together and realize that anger and attacking and violence, whilst incredibly fun, remember they don't have much to do in 1381, there's no YouTube. So while they're having their, they're venting their anger and feeling this catharsis of emotional release, what Tyler sort of comes together and says, you know what, we actually need a plan here if we want to achieve something. And what they start doing is marching towards London. Now, why on earth would they start marching from uh, Kent and Essex and towards London? Well, London was and is the capital of England. That is where the king was. That is where they thought their complaints, where their words would be heard. And they would demonstrate, they would force the king to negotiate because along the way, they would pick up more and more people. And as more and more people joined this, and the threat of violence to, uh, became not just to a few random villages around England, but to the capital itself. This is how they thought they were going to bring about change. Now, the rebels get to the entrance of the city of London on the 12th of June, 1381, and they demand that they be let in. 
So essentially an angry mob that's been causing violence for about two weeks gets to the gates of London and says, excuse us, we don't have an appointment, but let us in. You can imagine how that was taken at the time, but they did in fact get uh, access to the city of London. But first, let's talk about why they are angry. Now, this is all about the parliament of the previous year in 1380, which was held at Northampton. Northampton was at that time uh, slightly smaller, but almost the size of the bigger cities of, or towns, I should say, in the 14th century of England, such as York or London itself. So that's where Parliament was held that year. And there was already tensions with the citizens of London because uh, in the aftermath of in the late uh, 1300s, the late 14th century, there was a lot of death that passed through England. Maybe you've heard of it something called the Black Death, maybe, wiped out one third the population of Europe. That had come through and England was struggling. The people were struggling to recover from it. And it was because of that reason that Parliament was held at Northampton because of the plague. They didn't want to die, basically. So they passed these laws in Northampton. Um, the Crown was in a perilous financial state. The French and Spanish were thought to be planning to invade and they needed money. So what do they do when they need money? They raise taxes. So in this case, instead of just uh, raising taxes on the taxes people already paid, they decided they're going to levy another tax, a new tax. And some of the taxes were raised to three times their normal amount. Now, imagine, uh, if you can, what taxes are. Essentially, you pay depending on your rate, let's say about 30% of your uh, money goes for taxes. Imagine if they doubled that to 60. Well, that would cause me a problem. It would cause most people a problem. Now imagine if instead of going to 60, because that's just double, it went to 90. That would be an issue. And I might uh, start collecting a group of people to start marching towards Westminster as well. Okay, so you can understand why they're so upset. Okay, so. The first known backlash started in a town called Brentwood in Essex, and the people there threatened a tax collector, John Bampton, who ended up running for his life all the way back to London, and he informed his uh, bosses that the people were mad. So this escalated that uh, so much because as he was leaving and heading all the way back to London, the rumours started pressing, hey, we, we chased off the guy collecting the taxes and he left. And so in all these other towns, guess what? They started chasing people away uh, to, so they couldn't collect the taxes. And they started attacking symbols of the king and, symbol, and anything they thought that was representative of the oppressive power and tyranny that was up, uh, upon them. But as we talked about, eventually they started to get a bit more organized and they actually elected a leader. So this is a very, very interesting moment. They elected a leader and this leader was what? Tyler. This is why if you're reading any sources or uh, history books and you ever see it referred to as the Watt Tyler Rebellion, this is the same thing. So the Peasants' Revolt is the Watt Tyler Rebellion. The Watt Tyler Rebellion is the Peasants' Revolt. I've had this before where people um, have said, why would they elect a guy who was already you know, in, in trouble for starting a rebellion? No, no, it's the same thing. The Peasants' Revolt is the Watt Tyler Rebellion. The Watt Tyler Rebellion is the Peasants' Revolt, okay? Now, these numbers had reached to about 60,000. That is mammoth. Um, even today, 60, a crowd of 60,000 would be incredibly hard to control. But back then, 60,000 people is a lot. And they armed themselves with what they had available, which was essentially farming equipment. Okay, so axes that they used to chop wood, scythes that they used to uh, cut down the, the wheat. This is what, uh, if you've ever seen the uh, image of death, the thing that he carries, that's a scythe. Okay? It's quite deadly looking. Um, some uh, wealthier peasants might have had swords or bows and arrows, but generally speaking, they armed themselves with what they had available. And they begin to march to London, and they demand an audience with the king. The king at the time, King Richard II, uh, seen here uh, looking absolutely, absolutely regal, of course, um, he travels by boat along the Thames and he decides to meet the rebels at Mile End. Remember, there's no tube station there at the time. So this is why he travels along by boat. As a matter of fact, this is why London is, uh, becomes London because of its 
amazing access to the sea via the Thames, and it became a great trading uh, post as a result. Generally speaking, important towns and cities up until uh, probably the 1800s had to be positioned on a river or a port, otherwise they wouldn't be able to make any money. Okay, now he agrees to abolish the poll tax and going to give everyone an absolutely free pardon if they just leave. No one's going to be arrested. No one's going to get in trouble if you just go home. There will be no new tax. You can just go home. That sounds like a pretty good deal. But instead, things escalated because whilst these negotiations are going on, a group of peasants managed to break into the Tower of London which was considered to be a very secure location. And a powerful Lord Susbury, named Sudbury and another Lord named Hales are captured and they decapitate them. <gasps> oh my goodness. And by uh, legend, supposedly Lord Sudbury's head took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm tired already, eight to cut his head clean off. Remember, they didn't have military grade weapons these were things they were using on the farm. They weren't necessarily the sharpest tools in the shed. So the king meets the rebels again because he says, you know what? Things have escalated a bit quickly. I think we might need to negotiate. So they, he meets them outside of London this time so that nothing can go wrong uh, at a place called Smithfield. Now, this is what happens. What Tyler, the leader, is killed under mysterious circumstances by which I mean he goes out to meet the king to talk with him and there's a massive uh, scuffle of movement and all of a sudden Watt Tyler is dead. Now we don't know if someone attacked the king and the king's guards defended him or if he was simply murdered because he was too dangerous as a leader of all these peasants. We're not sure what happened, hence the mysterious circumstances. Like I say, there's a rumor that maybe he attacked or insulted the king no, so you've met me at last, you cowardly. <gasps> Did he call the king a coward? Kill him. Okay, but that would actually be a death sentence back in 1381. So some say that's what happened, and some say it was the king's men that attacked him first, because that way you can't negotiate with a dead man. In any event, the king goes back on his word. He says, I've been attacked. Uh, I will not grant anyone pardons, and I will not repeal the tax. So they round up all of the peasant leaders. So what Tyler's already dead, they round up other important leaders and they hang them. They are executed for treason against their king. Now, this is important. No one really knows for certain how Tyler was killed. Historians get most of their information about the peasants' revolt from chronicles. And these were written by monks who didn't actually see what happened. They only... Uh, wrote down what they heard from other people. So this was all based on rumors. Some people say that Wat Tyler tried to kill the king. Some say that the king's men murdered Wat Tyler. So this is where we end up with, and this is a common thing that happens in history where we get two sides of the story. And it depends on who you believe and who you listen to. On one side, the peasants have been betrayed by their murderous king. <gasps> what an awful king King Richard is. Oh, he's terrible. This is the worst. Poor Wat Tyler. But then on the other hand, the brave king has managed to defeat his violent thugs and rebels that have been murdering lords and destroying towns. And <gasps> oh my goodness, what an absolutely brilliant job to bring law and order to the people, King Richard. And you can see either story is almost as likely as the other. So it's very, very difficult to be certain as to what happened to what Tyler. Okay, so this is what ends up happening as a result of the Peasants' Revolt. Richard did not keep any of his promises. The taxes were levied, serfdom was not abolished, so basically the peasants still had to work for their lord this kept the feudal system in place for nearly another century in England. Uh, royal armies were raised and they put down the revolt. So all these peasants that had been marching um, along, they were chased down by the king's cavalry. The king sent out uh, swordsmen, armed men into a lot of towns. Uh, hundreds of rebels were hanged. And all of a sudden, a lot of the other peasants decided, you know what, I'll just pay the tax. It's fine. Um, the rebellion frightened the rich. 
Yeah, now this is important. This is actually an almost positive outcome for the peasants. It made them realize they could not push the poor too far. And guess what? No king collected a poll tax ever again. So in the long term, the peasants' revolt achieved what it set out to do. And over the following 50 years, to avoid another peasants' revolt, another uprising that maybe the king wouldn't be able to put down, maybe the peasants would take full control, the peasants were given uh, a lot of their demands over the next 50 years. So they could work for more money and slowly gain more freedoms from their lords to work where they pleased and make more of their own choices. Uh, and wages went up. In fact, very similar to what we see happening post COVID where a lot of the workers are saying, if you want us back to work, you're gonna to need to meet these certain conditions. And wages are going up and people are getting you know, more holiday pay, better healthcare, whatever it may be. So the uh, common case that we see in history is the more things change, the more they stay the same. So with all of that said, I hope that you have enjoyed this video. I hope you understand the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. And I hope that you have made your decision as to what may have happened to what, Tyler. See you next time.